So uh, this is going to be a very short overview. It's not going to be as long as the main talks because um, obviously. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so first of all, I'd just like to you know uh, say that this is a, this was really a team effort. Uh, my amazing colleagues and friends. If you see them running around, uh, feel free to walk up to them and ask questions. Uh, and also, we were uh, we had the we have a best paper award sponsored, which was made possible by Unitary, which is uh, was very helpful as well. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, hopefully, not too much. Of, this is going to be short, and not not too with too much overlap with the main uh, talks. Um, okay, so you know we have these uh, very benchmark-driven publication uh, since you know for for a few years uh, that has really transformed the field and how we uh, it's how we measure success and really we want to be more successful, so we are going to measure it, uh, and that can be that's obviously a good, a good thing. Um, but at the same time, this overemphasis on state of the art results over interesting questions can sometimes be uh, damaging, or at least not really uh, focus the output. You know, the things you see in publications not really be focused on uh, something that that you might think would be interesting and that we we should be doing. Uh, and uh, one one problem of that is that in order to achieve state of the art results, often what you need to do is throw everything under the kitchen sink. Um, to uh, get it to work really well, whatever method you're trying. And so this combination of many uh, enhancements is not only a black art, but um, it also uh, makes it very difficult to disentangle contributions from different elements of a very large system, even with ablations, uh, because ablations are usually very selective. They don't really mean all of the little um, decisions that you made, which add up to quite a lot usually. Uh, and another uh, another problem about this this culture is also that uh, often people find that findings do not generalize many f findings do not generalize to new data sets, um, which is unfortunate. Now, uh, one common answer to that, which is really good, is uh, to have private test sets, not validation sets, uh, with uh, limited evaluations. Um, and uh, this is good, but at the same time, you all know, you know, most of the papers we uh, C are actually not based on these. It is mostly reserved for things like challenges and uh, contests. Um, so not it's a very small minority. Um, and another thing, this was um, um, mentioned uh, before in David's talk, is that there's a lot of uh, hidden computation over the life of a project. All of the things that you've tried and didn't work, and uh, uh, you know it's often because we are doing uh, new things, things that are new to us, and uh, uh, these uh, many times some some um, of the outputs of that are mistakes or they just um, are not uh, what you want to focus on in the end. But this actually this behavior actually weakens the statistical results quite a lot. But it would be a big burden to uh, um, have people report, you know, keep a full research log and uh, report a lot of things that are not maybe not that interesting. Um, but this really weakens uh, the finding that you get in the end in terms of uh, statistical certainty. Um, so another another aspect is inconclusive results. So uh, are they useful? I mean, obviously you want conclusions, um, but uh, many times, even despite your best efforts, uh, you might not get inc uh, conclusive results. Um, uh, the review viewers are also aware of that. They try, uh, will try to strive under different models uh, to uh, prevent that, to be, to have the results be maximally informative. But sometimes that also can convey useful information uh, to the community as a whole because uh, it can allow you to avoid the duplication and provide insights into what you what can be done in later uh, iterations. Um, um, to get more information out of this. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, there's not any incentive right now to publish uh, these results. Um, there were some prior attempts, um, some great, uh, some really good venues, but and they, they did publish uh, some negative results, but um, on, on the other hand, 
uh, this didn't really pick up much steam. And I guess the, the reason is that it's not that glamorous. Nobody really wants to spend a lot of time uh, publishing um, a result that was not amazing. Um, so it, that, it's not because we're bad people. It's just uh, a matter of incentive. So it would be nice to have a way to incentivize people to publish a more balanced mix. And uh, that's one of the parts of uh, why pre-registration might be a good idea. Uh, and we're asking the question here, not really saying that it's for sure. Um, so um, you look at the process of how we usually conduct uh, uh, you know, our scientific analysis. We just, uh, this is more or less generic uh, cross science. We develop an idea, design a study, a uh, way to you know, uh, make your plan. And then you actually hear the part about collecting and analyzing data is where you just break out your code editor and uh, start running some experiments um, and so on. And then you write the, the and publish the re report, the paper, hopefully. So uh, I get pre-registration essentially intervenes. Instead of just um, having peer review in stage two, it actually gives you peer review in stage one. So uh, after you've designed your plan, uh, you get some feedback, and uh, that you can refine it here, you know, with with some extra uh, input from reviewers. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, I guess the gist, the the main main point is just that um, having papers being peer reviewed before experiments, and uh, there might be there are, there are probably lots of variations, but this is the core, um, and but it has a significant effect because. Uh, it really allows you to distinguish uh, post-diction from prediction. So, you know, post-diction, the, the problem of trying to retrofit a narrative to uh, what you've observed. So you observe and then make an hypothesis. Now, I mean, this can be, this can be useful for exploratory analysis, but you cannot support um, a, a extremely conclusive uh, uh, results and knowledge from, on just that. So you need to sort of turn it around and First, come up with a hypothesis, and then uh, get the observations that you need. And this is the prediction, which is hypothesis testing, which is um, can be much more more certain. Uh, and so, this clear separation is essential because uh, the things that Zach mentioned about people mixing up um, uh, definite um, uh, arguments with the fuzzy ones um, that are more based on intuition. Um, if you present post-diction as prediction, uh, it really makes you overconfident because you just have to get an explanation for what you, you've observed. There's no way to go back and uh, make the, you know, challenge the explanation that you gave at that point. So it's really backwards in that sense. Um, so one thing to watch out for. Um, so um, obviously, these were not the first to have that idea. In fact, uh, it was from uh, reading about what happened in other fields that uh, we got the idea to do it and try it in computer vision. Um, so uh, in medicine, it's, uh, uh, it's been mandatory for actually many decades uh, for uh, human clinical trials. And this is because of the high cost of uh, running those trials. Uh, I mean, human cost. So you obviously want to make sure that they're there's no unnecessary uh, suffering, that there's no uh, unnecessary or wasted data. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a big deal. And so yeah, that's why they pre-register pre um, uh, their experimental designs. And then it's psychology, which is something that was alluded to before. Uh, they had this very high profile replication crisis. And these, uh, you know, they, they, uh, this prompted a big discussion in their field. Uh, about how to prevent that, and uh, it, there was a massive shift to pre-registration, um, so that it's 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 very prevalent right now, um, and so essentially there's um, a listing from the uh, um, Center for Open Science uh, of journals with pre-registration with over 200, which is quite a high number, uh, even when you consider that there are thousands. It's you know, a large fraction. Okay, so uh, what are our goals with this? Uh, obviously, these are, uh, we, we hope that we've achieved some of them with this trial. Uh, some of them can also be just aspirational, like uh, we, you can tweak the rules 
and try to go move towards this. So uh, one of them is just shifting the focus towards question formulation and experimental design. Uh, so that was a discussion that the reviewers had uh, with uh, the authors, uh, and hopefully um, that was um, that was a, a good thing. And the other one is you know related that the authors do. Uh, are supposed to re receive uh, helpful feedback before any experiments. This also means that you know if you start going in a evaluating things in a um, way that actually reviewers have a suggestion and say uh, you know that's not really uh, that's not going to prove your point. Uh, they can make that intervention before uh, you actually waste all of that precious um, energy and effort, uh, and uh, hopefully. Um, should also increase the statistical significance and credibility of results, which I think is important, because um, you follow through with your uh, plan. And, and also, uh, there's this uh, funny phenomenon where you don't know what's going to happen in the end. So this provides a healthy mix of positive and ne negative results. And so I think there was this one study, uh, this meta study they did um, in sociology where they looked at pre-registered uh, pre-registration they had to make this sort of difficult call of whether uh, uh, each uh, study was overall conclusive or not. And they actually found that um, the, the number was close to 50%, which is um, not really bad if you compare it to, to chance, if you're just trying random things. If the reviewers and authors were poor predictors of uh, significance, then you would not get uh, those numbers. Uh, so as a meta-study, it goes to show that I mean, kind of uh, counter to uh, one thing that I think David mentioned, um, that actually the data shows that uh, people are can be good predictors um, of uh, where a paper is going to go uh, before experiments. So um, some points of criticism, which I think are really uh, good to discuss. Um, so um, uh, you know, what what this is not? It's not a place to easily publish ideas that don't work uh, because you have to convince reviewers that the proposal is interesting and original and that it's plausible. Uh, it's also not a, a way to claim ownership of an idea, like just flag planting um, without experiments because you do have to follow through with them. Um, and the other thing is also not, you can't guarantee, you know, just throw any far-fetched idea because you need to convince the reviewers that uh, this is, uh, it's plausible that you will get a conclusive non-null result in the end. Uh, and finally, of course, I mean, this, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. So I think this really is something that could be useful just in parallel with the traditional uh, process, uh, which is essentially what all we have so far. Uh, but it will fit better some types of papers. So just as a simple thing, um, a very high-level description of what we did, Got many details. It's really just we we had two phases where uh, uh, the um, authors had to uh, write their proposals, and we got, went through a um, um, a review process with uh, rebuttals, and then uh, they had a period of about of ten weeks when when they had to run the experiments. So this was perhaps a bit too short because of the timings of the workshop, um, but um, this is what we did, and should be able to tweak it. We had two double-blind reviews per paper. Um, the reviews proposed changes to the experiments before they were done. So on uh, we, in total, we had 17 submissions, accepted eight. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, actually, three were withdrawn because they did not finish the experiments. So this is a very high attrition rate, uh, which you don't get with uh, standard publishing. We were uh, a bit surprised. Uh, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> okay, well, I guess I revealed it. So, Best Paper Award, an Imperial Curl Study of the Relation Between Architecture and yeah. Are they in, uh, here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a, the uh, prize. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. And then there's also the honorable mention of learning representational invariance instead of categorization.
Okay. Um, and I guess that is all. Thank you for listening. And uh, we still have uh, we will have the rest of the program uh, about now. Thanks. <laughs>